All right, let's turn to Act Two. And scene one is consideration of the revised Virginia plan. The reason why it's called the revised Virginia plan is because Madison's original Virginia plan went through one or two revisions during Act One. Not major revisions, but minor revisions such as the Senate is in, uh, the states are involved in electing the Senate. They didn't get, Sherman didn't get what he wanted, which was the states doing the, being equally represented, but he got the states to do the electing of the Senate. So there are certain minor revisions to, <coughs> excuse me, Madison's original Virginia plan. So the text on the table, and this is something that I think you should try to remember as you're going through this material, there's always a proposition or a resolution or an amendment that's being considered. So however much the delegates go off on some big issue of the right to trial by jury and due process and whatnot, there's always something specific that is under consideration. So one of the things that we might want to do, Jason, just, as a, just to reinforce that, is in addition to looking at this Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4 outline, which is what we're doing, we might want to turn to, as a supplement to the day-by-day -day summary of what happens. See, so so that the four-act drama is trying to create a drama and a dynamic. The day-by-day -day summary is trying to keep you focused on what resolution is being, um, is, 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 is look. The, the day by day summary is within that same uh, resources of the convention. Uh, 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 online, yeah, uh, yeah. And if you come down, yeah, I think it's, yeah, yeah that's right, in, in this section, the convention, right? Day by day summary, yes. If you look at that one for a moment. So that another way of approaching the convention is, is to see. Resolution one of the Virginia plan, resolution two, um, and, 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 and there's where you really see the votes. Uh, th th resolution three, four, a, five, a, six, seven, seven, eight, nine, right, nine, 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 nine. Oh, I guess nine's important. What is that all about? Click, curiosity, uh, etc. So they get to number, no, uh, go back up, you see, 15. So they finished, they go through all the 15 proposals, then they start again. They go to and focus on resolution 4A and 5A, et cetera, et cetera. So you, that's another way of following and supplementing the four-act drama by doing a day-by-day -day summary. So that if, for example, we're now looking at the beginning of Act Two, you can see that if you keep going past the 18th, the 19th, the, um, yeah, we're now into, Revised Resolution One. That's the that's the the amended Virginia Plan or revised resolution. And so now they're they're going through it all again. Um, and and what happens is that the New Jersey folks that, who are made up of the New Jersey delegation, uh, Connecticut, uh, Delaware, um, the, uh, Mr. Martin from from Maryland. Um, New York delegation. <laughs> there are three delegates, Alexander Hamilton and two to outvote him. And they do. And what happens is that that group of people decide to put up a battle and not just simply fold. That's the story of Act Two. And they have two main arguments. And, and, they, and you can see it unfolding day by day. And what the New Jersey folks, I call them New Jersey because we've got the New Jersey plan and the Virginia folks, the Virginia plan. What they decide to do is uh, try a policy of attrition. They filibuster. And they, they have two particular arguments that they're making from June the 19th when Act Two begins uh, up until about June the 28th, 29th, when some decision has to be made. So for two weeks, the convention is sort of in the balance. It's not moving forward. 
it's somehow moving sideways. And that is part of conversation. That is part of bargaining. And uh, it, it, it's just who, who, who is willing to, um, to bend first and, and, and what happens. Well, that doesn't sound too uh, d democratic to me. Oh, no, welcome. Uh, I think that's what negotiations are all about. Uh, and, and when do you compromise and when do you don't? What are the two arguments that the New Jersey folks come up with? One, what we're doing here is illegal. Now that's the rule of law argument, which is a very powerful argument, and particularly from conservatives, that uh, to invoke the rule of law against some radical bunch of people is, uh, is, 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 is a compelling one, it's a persuasive one. And, and how do they make that argument? They make the argument on the basis that the Confederation Congress, there's a, there's a government in existence, by the way, while these folks are in Philadelphia arguing to, to, to scrap or to improve the government that's in existence. Um, the problem is the government in existence, which is in New York, isn't doing very much because most of the delegates are there in Philadelphia deciding whether to scrap it or to uh, improve it. So there's no quorum that's going on in, 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 in New York. How fortunate. <clears throat> Now that's happening. Uh, the argument is it's illegal what we're doing, namely the Virginia plan is illegal because it oversteps its mandate. It goes way beyond what the Confederation Congress authorized in February of 1787. Um, and the answer to that is there is a different law background. That is, there's another authorization for what we're doing here, and it is the Annapolis Convention. So you've got dueling authorizations. The, the, the Annapolis Convention occurred in September of 1786, led by Virginia. Started off as a dispute over boundaries the, in, around Delaware and New Jersey, etc., and it exploded. I shall say expanded, I'd rather use, expanded into a grand discussion of what we have here is a systemic problem. I mean, how often does that happen in American politics? Some, some issue about a dog barking over the fence at you, and, and then it turns into a property rights argument about zoning laws. I, I, I mean, that's a very American phenomenon. And so we cannot deal with this issue say the delegates at Annapolis, unless we deal with the entire system. And to deal with the entire system means we need a grand convention to talk about it. Well, how do we hold a grand convention? We're Americans. We hold it. We don't have to ask the, the, the monarch for permission. We don't even have to ask the, the government for permission. Haven't you heard of grass move, grass roots? Uh, grass move, truthsmiths. Yes, right, there you go. No, I haven't actually. So if you go to uh, so grassroots movements, why do we need someone else? We the people can authorize meetings. And so we do. And so you get two groups, one from September of 1786 up to February, following Virginia, in which six of the states agree that they will send delegates. The other six, you don't need to talk about Rhode Island. <laughs> The other six decide that they want a more proper legalistic grounding for action. So six wait for the Confederation Congress. So if you listen to the Annapolis, we have a systemic problem which we need to deal with and we don't have to wait on anybody to have a talk. And if you listen to the more legalistic point of view, we need a specific mandate. And that mandate comes from Congress which says, look, go come up with ideas to improve make it work, and come back to us. So the legalists, the New Jersey folks, are appealing to the extent or limitation of the mandate coming out of Congress. The other folks, Virginia, lead the way. And that is, why should we scruple about such niceties when the future of the republic is at stake? Of course, there's no republic yet, and so one wonders what's at stake. But that shows you an insight. That is, it's not so much all the bad that was, being, that was being done, but rather the opportunity that was being lost. And I think if you read Washington's diaries and you see Madison and Hamilton, they're more concerned 
that, you know, the sun does set, the, the, the birds still tweet, yes, 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 you are absolutely correct. You know, we're, we're, are we better off today than we were in 1776? Yes, yes. But you know what? We could be so much better off. We could be the city on a hill. We could be a shining example to the world. And we're, and we're missing that opportunity. We have it in our hands to do something, and we don't care enough to do something. And those are the two sides. And why are we, in other words, why are we here? And what are we supposed to be doing? So that drags on. The other argument, that's, that's the first one. Are, are we doing something legal or illegal? illegal? And uh, is there a higher law than simply narrow statutory law at stake? Um, the second argument is one of necessity. And that's where the New Yorkers and New Jersey folks say, in effect, this plan will never get the vote of the people. If we, it, it, since you're so insistent, Madison, to get the consent of the governed. See, Ma one of Madison's big arguments, why he didn't want to compromise, is that the Articles of Confederation did not rest on a legitimate foundation. They rested on the authority of each state who did it out of necessity in, in a wartime. The only just moral foundation for legitimate free government is where the people themselves consent to it. And the Articles of Confederation do not have the consent of the people. I want this constitution that we're building now to have the consent of the governed, the consent of the people in ratification. And so the New Jersey folks say, well, if you're so insistent on that, you want to bypass the Articles of Confederation and get the approval there. You want to go directly to the people. Let us tell you something. The people aren't going to buy this. The, Amer the American people know what's in their own interest. And the American people have never seen this before. And the American people, therefore, are not going to be behind it. I'm speaking on behalf of the American people. And people like Wilson and Madison say, how do you know what the American people want? Have you held a focus group? You had polls in the room and you had um, them showing up and telling you, how, how do you know? That's the job. Look, our job here is to do the best that we can and then go out and persuade the American people to adopt it. We're not talking about go out and put the best spin on it. We're talking about persuading. And once you talk about consent of the governed, you have to be able to persuade. Now, there's going to be hucksters. There's going to be people who's going to, re who's going to rely on your fear. The number of ads I see that somehow, you were fooled, you were fooled. But trust us, operators are standing by. <laughs> and just in case you missed the number, I'll say it four times. <laughs> Five will bore you. So you're going to get people relying on your fears. You're going to get people relying on your hopes. And sometimes the fears never materialize and the hopes never materialize. And that's part of the problem of self-government. How do you distinguish between truth and fiction? How do, you, how do you know when somebody's manipulating you and not manipulating you? How do you, how do you tell what is low ground and what is high ground? Well, today we have become so in tune with low ground that we've almost missed the point that high ground can exist. And one of my tasks in higher education is to try to keep a spark of the high ground alive. Um, I mean, I remember I, I gave a talk at Redlands, at Pepperdine, excuse me, on, on Wednesday. And it was, it was the 100th anniversary of Charles Beard's economic interpretation of the Constitution. And so what I did was a constitutional interpretation of Charles Beard. And, and the, what, what Charles Beard, in effect, said is if I know what the investment portfolio and land holdings are of the framers, I can tell you exactly how they voted and what the Constitution means. I don't need to look at language and words and debates. I just can go from, from that straight. And 
you know, but when I think when I think about the power of, of, of that argument and its impact all the way through American education, it makes me it, 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 you know it, it makes me tremble because it's precisely because Charles Beard may be may be dead, but Charles Beard has had an incredible influence on how we teach our young, and at the heart of it is that the founding is terrible, the founding is ill-founded, and. You, and I don't see how you can love something that's presented as ugly. And so my approach is to try to present things in, in what I hope is, 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 is a balanced way, to keep the high ground alive. Once you go the, the, the Charles Beard route, you almost close the high ground. Everything becomes a matter of narrow self-interest. Everything becomes a matter of class interest. There's no reason to look at the Christie painting. There's no reason to look at all of those things because we know the windows are closed. The curtains are drawn. We know what is going on. Chef the people. And that's low ground. Now, we've become so used to low ground explanations in life that I think it's very difficult to even believe when somebody said <laughs> that... <coughs> That seems to be motivated by your own good. I mean, parenting must be terrible. You know, and my, my, my only answer to all that is, when are you going to stop blaming your, fa your fathers? And the answer is, when you have children of your own. <laughs> you quit blaming your mother and father yet? Oh, yeah. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Founders, parents, give birth. Then they regret it. <laughs> yeah, I remember my mother saying, God, it's about my 50th birthday, and she says, God, congratulations. She says, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not, I'm not just congratulating you on your 50th, 50th birthday. This is the 51st anniversary of the discovery of the pill. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. No, parents give birth. Parents lay foundations. Framers frame. They don't lay carpet. They put up frames. Founders lay the foundation. Okay? Founders are not closers. Framers are not painters. There's something called self-government. There's a next generation. And their job is to govern themselves. The Constitution or what this has created is not the Koran. Nor is it whatever you want it to mean. It's tough. It's just like parenting. It's just like growing up. How do you govern yourself? How do you say yes? How do you say no? How do you compromise? Churches have to deal with it all the time. Should women wear a hat in churches? Should priests turn their back on you or look at you? Is it a matter of salvation or is it a matter of culture? Making those decisions, are fine. that's what life is, is, is all about. So what are they doing? They're trying to provide a, a framework, a foundation, based on their own experience and what has and has not worked in, in, in life, and their understanding of human nature, and, and understanding that freedom is fragile and needs to be protected. Think about it. And e not, not just even, but today, freedom still has to be defended. If freedom is the default position, why do we have to keep defending freedom? It's, people don't have to defend equality. Equality seems to be the obvious. Inequality, you say, well, oh, but you're unequal. Uh, uh, as if equality is, the, is, the, is, the, is sort of the, the, the foundation. But if freedom is the foundation, then you're going to get some inequality. And, and the question is, how much? And how much can you tolerate? And how important is liberty? Et cetera, et cetera. So I... I, I a person asked me once, well, if liberty is so central, why do we have to keep defending it? The answer is because something seems to be more important than liberty. Security, equality, community. Something seems to be competing with liberty. Um, if men were angels, said Madison in Federalist 51, government wouldn't be necessary. But men aren't angels. I would add... And if men were beasties, free government would be impossible. So that there has to be some decency in human beings in order to pull this off. There has to be decency in parenting in order for children to be raised properly. There has to be decency in your teaching, otherwise your, your students are not going to be. So 
Is there an element of decency? Is there an element of patriotism? Is there an element of fellow feeling? We don't have to be completely unselfish. The point is, once you've followed Baird's route, there is no room for anything other than complete selfishness. And that's the danger of, 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 um, of what I'm saying by Beard. So what I want to keep alive in this second point is it, with, with regard to, because um, I know you thought that I completely lost my way and, and, and to know what this had to do with the second reason. Um, and if I keep going like that, praising myself, I will forget. So here it is. The, the <laughs> If you're going to argue from necessity, then there is no, you're not going to take a risk. You're not going to think that you, you're supposed to think of the next generation, that you are in the gap between the past and the present. You have to figure out what do you owe the past, for if it weren't the past, you wouldn't be here. And what do you owe the future, for you have an obligation to the future. But you also have an obligation to govern yourself as you're traveling between the past and the future. So there's this argument over will it work, will it fly, is an important question of what it means to govern ourselves and what do we owe the past and what do we owe the future as we go through life. And, and what uh, Madison is saying is what we owe the future is to come up with the best possible plan that we can and persuade people. And they can always say no. Or they could always propose amendments. Well, that presupposes that the people are civically educated, that they care, that they listen, and they get engaged. That is, it requires that rare combination of civic education and, and civic engagement. And too often, I think, we find that there's, there's civic education without civic engagement. But more importantly, these days, we seem to have civic engagement without civic education. Uh, uh, I think that the question is, is both. And what the founding shows is the importance of both. We have to be able to be educated before we become engaged. But if you don't become engaged, then the education is for naught. Um, so this is what, I mean, for two weeks they, they, they in effect go round and around and around this question. Now, Washington writes in his diary, you know, I'm, I don't know what the heck is going on here. I don't know why I left my farm. I don't know what, what is going on. I, mean, I, 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 I feel terrible about what's happening to my country. And one obvious point would be, well, why don't you do something about it? People will follow you into valleys and forges all over the place. <laughs> and um, you know, one, of the, one of the titles I did give to it, to, some of these speeches is 10 different ways to love your framers, which, which is a sort of a play on uh, Paul Simon's 51 different ways to leave your lovers. And I, I never quite figured out why you need 51 different ways. I mean, one way is good enough for me. But, but uh, <laughs> yeah, out the door, or <laughs> jump the forge, George, you know, something like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, now I will lose my way if I don't, if, 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 if if I don't get by. Uh, one thesis is, is that this whole event is over the general's head. He doesn't have the faintest idea what is going on. He knows how to ride a horse, and he knows how to run a farm, but he doesn't know how to preside over a constitutional convention of raucous individuals. And he just doesn't know what to do. And in, in his diary reflects that. My position is a little bit more elevated than that low ground position. And the, it is that George Washington realizes that there, one day there will be world without George Washington. And that as much as admired as he is, that, that, that and also he might be, he might have this self-image that I mean, there'll be very few Washingtons to follow me. Uh, that the people have to learn how to govern themselves. And if these folks, these well-educated, experienced folks, cannot govern themselves during this period of time, I have every reason to worry about the future of my country. So in effect, he left them alone. And they did come up with a solution. 
Well, that's my high ground explanation, but you will find many low ground explanations for Washington's uh, behavior. He couldn't be bothered. It was above his head. He didn't feel it was right and proper for him to do. Uh, but he was, he was meeting people on the side, and he was, he was, he was giving guidance. Um, but if we turn to, to, um, uh, to June the 29th, Uh, June the 29th, uh, June the 30th, let me see. Oh, yeah. What happens on June the 30th is rather remarkable. Okay. The Connecticut delegation again, Ellsworth, Sherman, they come back again and say, remember about six weeks ago we came up with a compromise? The, the people can elect and be represented in the House, and the, se the, the states elect and be represented in the Senate. But we really didn't have a good, strong argument to make other than necessity. We have an argument now. The argument is we are partly national, partly federal. Which means that for we are a continental ag arrangement for certain limited things, but we are state-based for others. And the argument, that has never been seen in the history of the world before. That's correct. We're either totally national or totally federal, but never a mixture. And this is the breakthrough. The breakthrough is we're Americans. We don't have to be Germanic about this, either or. We can live with contradiction. Or we can think outside the box and create a new box. Now, that's going to be fluid. It's going to go up and down and around and around. That requires civic education on behalf not only of the people, but also of our leaders to understand that um, this, is, this needs constant attention as to what issues we place at the Washington level and what things we leave at the local level. And that's, that, that is a problem, and it won't go away as long as you have a federal or, or not, partly federal, partly national republic. So Ellsworth is making that case. And other people are making the case, which you read in your textbook, this is a large state, small state issue. Well, I, 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 again, the older I get, the less interested I am in single interpretations of life. And small state, large state doesn't quite do it. Now, I can understand that, 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 that there's some of that going on. But what Sherman's argument is, is not about the small states need being, to be, be represented, but states as states need to be represented, whether they're large or small. And what Madison is arguing is that people need to be represented, whether they're tall or short. They just need to be, that, that, that's what is the concept, popular representation or state representation. It, it happens that people come in different sizes and shapes, and so do states. So it's not just simply um, the, 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 the size of a state. OK. And Madison then issues this, this very interesting point which he says, look, the great divide in American politics, now and into the future, the great divide is having or not having slaves, rather than large or small states. People just don't divide based on the size of the state in which they reside. Slavery is a critical question. And unless we deal with that issue, uh, somehow, somewhere, we are in for trouble. Now, you can say, well, so far, have they really dealt with that question? And the answer is no. Uh, why not? Because they're talking about <laughs> whether they're going to represent states or represent people. The three-fifths clause enters as part of that conversation. And we can chat about that um, over lunch, or I'm going to quit in 10 minutes, and we can, have a, another, we can have 10 minutes of discussion. I just wanted to bore you the first session. So I, uh, um, I mean, I bored myself, and now it's your turn to be bored. So I, 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 I'll, I'll quit in a moment. But <clears throat> what happens is that Ellsworth produces this partly national, partly federal proposition, which to repeat means that the House will be elected by the people and the people will be represented. 
The Senate will be elected by the states, and the states will be represented. That is, comes from the Connecticut folks as early as June the 11th with Sherman, but without that kind of explanation of that we're partly national, partly federal. And Ellsworth puts it back on the table. So in Act Two, where are we? We're right back to where we started over this issue of representation. And the vote is taken, and it is a 5-5-1 vote on Ellsworth's proposition. Now, that's 10, that's 11. You can say, well, who's not there? Rhode Island. That's 13. And New Hampshire hasn't shown up yet, didn't have any money. So there are 11, 11 states, <clears throat> and so one state divided. And it was Georgia, and you can just imagine how dramatic this is, because the way they voted was from the most northern state to the most southern state. And Georgia is the most southern state. So you have five, five. How does Georgia vote? And the answer is, we're divided. And that threw the entire convention into what Sherman called full stop. And so something has to be done. So that the dynamic of the conversation, the sort of the necessity of this conversation, leads them to create a committee. And the committee is called the Jerry Committee. This is one of the earliest committees that have been, that, that's created to try to settle this question. And the Jerry Committee is made up of one member from each of the states. And if you track those members and where they have stood on this argument over the last 12 uh, it, it almost seems like 12 months, uh, o over the last two months, you will see that Jerry from Massachusetts is probably the most susceptible to compromise, rather than Gorham and King, who are really in Madison's corner. Ellsworth, well, it could have been Sherman. But Connecticut is the compromising state, trying to find some common ground. Yates from New York. Well, it could, you could have chosen Hamilton, but Hamilton left the day before because he was bored and didn't, he said, call me when you get out of the sandbox. But Hamilton wouldn't have got elected to this committee anyway because he was clearly pro-Madison. Patterson of the Patterson plan and the New Jersey plan. Franklin, the one from the Pennsylvania delegation who was most willing to compromise. Bedford. Luther Martin, I mean, they're on there to, I mean, they, they voted for the New Jersey plan in the first place. From Virginia, not Madison, not Randolph, George Mason, Davy, Rutledge, Baldwin. Baldwin was the one from Georgia who voted to make it a tie. In short, if Madison won pretty overwhelmingly in Act One. Here we are, two-thirds of the way Act Two, and the whole dynamic has changed. This committee is going to come up with a compromise, which Madison is not going to like because he argued against this very compromise for six weeks. The, what does the committee come up with? The Connecticut Compromise, which is urged and encouraged by Franklin. Sometimes Franklin gets the credit for the Connecticut Compromise. And that time may be given to the committee and to such as choose to attend the celebrations of the anniversary of independence, the convention adjourned until Thursday, which means how fortunate or providential that they came to this moment of doing something at the very day, July the 4th of Independence Day. And uh, uh, I just leave it as, as accidental, providential, or, or or what? I mean, people of pious reflection would not help but see some providential um, um, element in it. Um, and Franklin even suggested that one way out of their difficulty was to pray. And no one believed Franklin's uh, suggestion. Franklin? And Hamilton was gross enough to say, we need no foreign aid. Um, <laughs> and, <clears throat> but there are other stories I will keep to myself. So if we scroll down, we will see that for the next week, I mean, if, if you want the low, low ground of the convention, this would be the week to find it. 
because some state is going to say, well, we really need three votes. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we, you should have two votes. You should have such and such. This is the one week of really sort of low ground bargaining that you would expect out of a contemporary Congress, not out of a founding fathers. And then they rise to the occasion and say, let's have a vote. And it comes on um, July the 16th. And they agree, 5-4-1. Now, we're down to 10. What's happening? Uh, well, Rhode Island isn't there. And New Hampshire hasn't arrived. New York has left. Uh, Hamilton has left, so the reason for Lansing and Yates to be there is gone. They're home plotting against the ratification of the Constitution, and Hamilton has gone home to plot in favor of ratification of the Constitution, or to come back when people get serious out of the sandbox and listen to his June the 18th speech. And so we got a 5-4-1 vote on the Jerry Committee. House proportional, Senate equal representation for each state, and then there's a money bill provision, which at this level we'll just put to one side. Uh, but it did persuade Mason to, to go over. And I have to ask you, what, that doesn't strike me as a compromise. A 5-4-1 vote sounds, uh, it doesn't sound very bipartisan mm -hmm. or compromising to me or consensus. So in what way is this a compromise? And the answer is, it seeks a third way. The third way is a compromise between wholly national and wholly federal. We are partly national, partly federal. This, the five in favor says, are, are saying, we buy that. We buy partly national, partly federal. The four who say no is, are those who want to be wholly national. There's Madison among the four states that vote no. Virginia splits because Mason is in favor of the compromise and Madison is against the compromise. And it's at this point that George Washington becomes much more important in the deliberations of the entire convention because he's starting to see a split in the Virginia delegation. And that the split is going to become Mason and, all of, all, and of all people, Randolph on one side, and Madison and Blair on another side so you got two against two starting to emerge, starting to emerge right now. And during the month of August and September, Washington, see it's not how much Washington spoke. It's not that everything is above him. He needs to do two jobs. One is to be president of the convention and the other one as a delegate in Virginia. And head of Virginia, which is going to be head of the Virginia plan to get things done. That is an extremely delicate task of statesmanship and has been unappreciated. And I think that you would do well to, um, to, to encourage your students to pursue, you know, to pursue that. Let me, um, uh, um, I want to do two things and then, and then quiet. Um, so now finally, they can return to the revised Virginia plan and go through the resolutions now. Finally, right? Because they've broken the, they've broken the issue. They've, they've said, all right, negotiations can continue. We, um, we're, we're on the right track. We haven't finished everything yet, but the, the big issue has been settled. And Madison decides not to fight back. He says, let it go. I don't like it, but let it go. We've got other things to get on with. And so they go through re revised resolutions. Six, nine. Agree at 9, 11, 12, 16, uh, number 9 again, 9, 9, 11, uh, 17, 18, and 19. And then on the July the 24th, they say, okay, we've been through this document twice. We've settled the big issue of representation between the states and the pe people with this Connecticut compromise. What we need now is to create a committee to come up with a plan and just take a break from all of this. And the committee that's created, and this is funny, how was this committee chosen? It is, what is, we don't know. I can, I can give you my hunch, but we don't know for sure. But it's, it's a committee in which 
you've got one, two, three, four, five people. You can have 11, one from each state, but you don't. It's five. There are five people selected. Rutledge from South Carolina. Randolph from Virginia. So Gorham, Massachusetts. Ellsworth, Connecticut. Wilson, Pennsylvania. It's fascinating. You've got, if you, put, if you look at it from where, where these people are from, you've got one from Massachusetts, one from Virginia, one from Pennsylvania. Those three states are the majority of the people. You need three, you need, you need one from each of those three. You need Connecticut because they're the ones who forged the compromise. And then you have an outlier. You just can't have four. You have to have somebody. I mean, this is how committees work. You have an odd number. An odd number of odd people. <laughs> and so Rutledge from South Carolina. And the question is, why, why Rutledge on there? And if we go down a bit, we will see. Um, you know, let's go up a bit. If we can't go down, we can go up. Um, yeah, I'm, what I'm looking for is the Pinckney Statement. Um, where is it? Pinkney, you see Pinckney Statement? Yeah, it's like, yeah, let's go down. Keep going. So down or up? Down. Up. 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 No, it's not that far back. Can't be. You know this thing better than I do? That's not true. <laughs> 20, is it the 20? Yeah, yeah. 20, try, try the 23rd. General Pink, all right, they haven't set, they have not decided yet on the composition of the committee. And they're General Pinckney from South Carolina. By the way, the only delegation in which all the delegates, there were four from South Carolina, but the only delegation in which each of the delegates attended every session was South Carolina. And that should give you an, a, 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 some insight into your, your ability to affect the dynamics of a conversation if you're always present. General Pinckney reminded the convention that if the committee, this committee of five that's to be elected, should fail to insert some security to the southern states against an emancipation of slaves and taxes on exports, he should be bound by duty to his state to vote against their report. It was agreed in part that the committee consist of five members to be appointed tomorrow. That's a shot across the bow. That's drawing a line in the sand, whatever you want to say. And um, it's, it really requires some openness to go back and see, well, who would possibly give Pinckney this, in, this, um, this hint that people were thinking about emancipating slaves? And, uh, and, and his, his point was, you think about emancipating slaves? We're out of here. We're not signing. So the last two months are gone. That's a threat. And I think it's a very interesting way of handling it that somebody from South Carolina gets on that committee. And so what we need to do when we, after lunch is to see what impact that warning and what impact Rutledge from South Carolina has on the first draft of the Constitution. Uh, I will end with, uh, if we go to the Christie painting for one mom for one moment, I wanted to just show you something that in, in the Christie painting, I think which fits in wonderfully with what we just done. Uh, if we scroll down, and this is the signing of the Constitution and we, and we, in this section, and the interactive scene, which is the first one, the Christie painting. Um, if you t t take, your, take your scroller and you just go on anybody, and you go in Washington, for example, and you click Washington, and uh, it'll give you a whole biography of what, 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 uh, hit click more, you'll see a whole biography of what Washington did at the, at the convention. You don't have to know who these delegates are. The scroller will tell you who they are as, we, as you go on. And there are other paintings, 
and then it gets more difficult for the students. You can give them a test with it, but you, the, the answers are there. But what I wanted to show you was, according to Christie's painting, which was in the 1930s, the 150th anniversary, there are three superdelegates, Franklin, Hamilton, and Madison. Hamilton was only there for half the time. His real contribution comes in ratification of the Federalist Papers and the Treasury, Secretary of Treasury. Franklin, I think, was, he was there practically all the time, but really was not that influential other than his name. But his importance was, was what happened before the convention. Madison is the real hero. But the point, the, the point is that Christie takes these three delegates out of their delegations and make them super delegates. But he is interpreting this in, in terms of not what exactly went on at the convention. But if you notice, the only delegation which is at a table, if you go and you see there, that, that ta and you go up, William Johnson, and then next to him is Roger Sherman. Ellsworth isn't there because he, he left early. But look at all the crumpled paper on the floor. And what, how I interpret that is that according to Christie, they didn't get their way. They didn't get, they were frustrated in this entire in, in, in this entire enterprise, that the three people we should be looking at, in addition to this guy with his hand up, with his, who took the notes, is, are these three. These are the three superdelegates. Whereas the Connecticut delegation is all frustrated, sitting in the background. And I ask you, having just gone through Act One and Act Two with me, whether if you had students who were artists and you asked them to portray the convention, would they have the same portrayal as, uh, as, as, as Christie? And so you can use the Christie painting as a, a mode of interpretation and check it against the text. Now, we've got five minutes that I want to, um, I, I really want to open up, and I hope that some questions have, have crept into your mind. And then at 11.30, we've got five, 10 minutes, at 11.30 we'll go to lunch, is that correct? And you will, you will guide us at 11.30 as to where we go? And then we come back when? Um, uh, like 12.20, so we can start at 12.30. And we'll start at 12.30. So it, you, you're on for 10 minutes. Eight and a half minutes. Eight and a quarter minutes. <laughs> yes. I always struggle with the we're partly national, we're partly federal, because the words today that we use in our classroom, national and federal, don't match with what these um, how, how the words are being used here. I understand the concept. I, I do get that um, in the context of the time, this was something that was completely <coughs> so far out of the box. It, it, it posed this, this quagmire for them. But help me again. We are partly national. I know it's in the question of representation. But when I think of national, we're talking about the people having the vote in the House and partly federal is the states being represented by the Senate. But I'm, I'm just not understanding the word use, national and federal. Good for you. The word confederal and federal meant exactly the same thing back in 1787. Con did not add anything. National meant, in fact, people. A nation. Federation or confederation, meaning the same thing, meant, an, meant a group of pre-existing states which contain people. So the issue of partly national, partly federal meant are we going to be a nation of people or a nation of states? And the compromise is we're going to be partly national, partly federal. What shall we call that? There was no name for that. What has that name become? Federal. What then happened to the old meaning of the word federal? It became the new word. It became the description of this new partly national, partly federal. So what now do we call the old word federal? The answer is confederal. So that, so that the compromise, if you read your textbooks today, is that they came up with a, a, a federal arrangement which was a mixture of partly national, partly confederal. 
which is not a bad way of explaining it, but it misses the point that at that time there wasn't a word to explain this phenomena. Uh, some would say in, Tocqueville describes it as an incomplete national government. And the compromise can be looked at in two ways, the partly, partly. It can be looked at in terms of structure, and it can be looked at in terms of power. Structure is, we're not wholly national. Yeah, there's, there's more to it going on than, than people. And there's, and, and, and it's structure is, is it's partly states. That is, <laughs> when you open a, the, the preamble, it doesn't say we the people of America. It says we the people of the United States. That shows the partly national, partly federal. It doesn't say we the states like Patrick Henry wanted. Nor does it say we the people of America as some others wanted. By the way, when we elect the president, we don't, let, we don't elect a president of America. We elect the president of the United States. In which we go to each state and campaign each state. Well, you can ar make an argument. People have made, that ar made the argument ever since the beginning. That doesn't seem to make sense for a national democracy. Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. But if a federal democracy, it does or you know, a confederal democracy or whatever you want to call it. Does that help you? Very much. Yes? I'm amazed that the individual states at that point <coughs> gave so much ability to poor people in the state to come and make these decisions. And it's amazing to me, unless I guess it was all in place because they already had the, the 13 groups set up, but it, was there much time taken to selecting the individuals who were going to go represent the constitutional Dependent on e Dependent on each state. You have to follow that through. Uh, we, if, if, Jason, if we go to the delegates um, section, Yeah, we, we, I mean, there are a number of ways. Connecticut, um, it's somewhere obvious. Uh, Lansing and Yates from New York, they were part of the Clinton faction. So that's part of local politics, and they had to go. Alexander Hamilton was a mover and a shaker for Continental Wide, and it reflects the division within New York between the upstate and the downstate, the Federalists, the Anti-Federalists, the, 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 the city slickers and the country bumpkins, and, and all of that. Um, Pennsylvania, all, it, it, this reflects a, a battle within Pennsylvania uh, all of these people came from Philadelphia. The opposition is all outside Philadelphia, all the pro. And then you can start getting into commercial interests, the ports, the commerce, etc. all there. Um, Robert Morris was the financier of the revolution. Um, Mifflin and Clymer and Fitzsimmons uh, were in the state assembly. Um, James Wilson was a was, was big lawyer. Um, Governor Morris, you can't leave him out. Uh, you have to have his peg leg in there. The, the, uh, South Carolina, um, the, these, these folks are heavyweights in South Carolina. Uh, the, the Rutledge and the Pinckneys, etc. So, I mean, that's, it's, that, that's, that's obvious. Um, but were they done by election? Or yes. No, no, by, by, by the state legislatures. Oh, okay. Right? The state, state legislatures selected them to go to the to go and in effect represent the state at this grand convention. <clears throat> and the question was, on what authority do they have to do this? The Annapolis Convention or the Confederation Congress? Uh, I mean, we, could, we could take another look. I mean, for example, th these guys knew each other. I mean, if, if, if we take a look at the continental experience, for example, um, it, it's a this would still be it, it, this would still be on the delegates section. Yeah, um, continental experience of the delegates. Look who signed the Declaration of Independence. Who were there? Um, continental. Who served in the Who served in the Continental Congress between 1776 and 1781? Who 
who helped write their own state constitutions between 1786 and, and uh, 1776 and 1780? All of these had experience writing constitutions. Um, who signed the Articles of Confederation? Um, is this a cross reference, Professor Lord, with who was at the convention? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Write a cross reference. Um, I was mentioning Charles Beard. If we go to the occupation. Right? Um, I mean, we could do all of this. We could talk about it, right? Which we're, we're not really today. I'm just, just kind of filling time to lunch. The, the, uh, I mean, if you look at the occupations, uh, who held public securities? Who was involved in lending and investments? Who in mercantile manufacturing and shipping? Who's in real estate and land speculation? Who are planters and slaveholders? When you ask Charles Beard for an economic explanation of the Constitution, this is what he's looking at. Not just he's, he's putting it in as a factor to, to help explain, but it is the sole explanation that you need to know. And he's much more interested, as and now Alex and I have been t talking about this, he was much more interested in real estate, land speculation, mercantile, than he was in planters and slaveholders. Because in terms of the, sort of the, 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 the soft Marxist interpretation, it's between the capitalists and the proletariat, and this is sort of like a holdover for feudalistic days, and capitalism replaces feudalism. And, um, and so what do you do with this? Well, it's not, it doesn't quite fit in. But once Beard has been challenged, which Beard can be challenged, because a number of these ended up in debtor's prison, there was no, you know, not, not too big to fail. These guys were not too big to fail. Uh, but they were entrepreneurs. What's so wrong with being an entrepreneur? Somebody like Beard making profit and, and owning property is automatically dirty. Okay? These people were risk takers in a sense. The convention is full of risk takers. Okay? What has happened since Beard has been sort of tamed? The particulars of Beard have been tamed. The Beard thesis that you can interpret words by reducing the words to who said the words, and who said the words can be reduced to what you own and what you don't own in terms of property. Once you sort of challenge some of the details, then you're still left with this. And the, the most scholarship that's coming out now in the Constitutional Convention is on this. And you'll see book after book talking about the slaveholders' constitution. So the whole uh, convention is now read through the eyes of this. And the difficulty, oh, Alex, I now remember what I was going to suggest to you the other day in our conversation. Um, he, was, he was very, very good at, the, at, at, at Pepperdine the other day, pushing me on this. And, um, but what I wanted to suggest to him is that if you take a look, and I just remembered, uh, George Mason was one of the biggest slaveholders and one of the biggest opponents of slavery. And so too was George Washington. And, uh, and, and Luther Martin, just read what Luther Martin said. Uh, and there's a low ground and a high ground. And the low ground is they didn't want any more slaves coming in because they could breed them themselves. That's low ground. High ground is, this is what I wanted to say, um, but was that the high ground is if you want to know about the dangers of drugs, who do you go to? What's that? Yeah, drug addict. So I would say the, the, when George Mason says that slavery is not only bad for the slave, it's terrible on the master and what it does to the master. It's not just hypocrisy. He's, a drug, he's, a, he's an addict and he can't break the habit. But he realizes that habit should not be continued for the next generation. Uh, you say, ah, you're letting him off the hook. Well, what do you do with, it was no tough love program. Uh, Jefferson was very much the same. I like black women. <laughs> I just want to add to that. It's like every parent wants a better life for their child than what they had. The high ground would be to say they wanted a better life for America than what? Well, what's interesting is when we get to Act 3, and I invite you, I mean, August the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, August, that entire week is taken up with the slavery question. And you say, well, what took them so long to get around to it? Well, they were doing other things before that. Time to eat. <laughs>